national emergency. Director Christopher Nolan calls him the most important person that ever lived. What? In his story, one of the biggest imaginable. I can perform this miracle for you. In this video, I'm going to look at a few milestone scenes to get a glimpse of why the editing is so powerful. It feels almost unstructured. There's a clear structure in this entire film. And the editor, Jennifer Lame, is likely to win the Oscar. Thank you to Chris and Emma. We'll look at three scenes here. Alvarez? One that was fully shaped through the writing and filming. That's just an example of Chris's incredible efficiency. And the script is like the Bible for him. What? What is it? And one that was found in the so editing. Here we're back in the what looks like a classroom. So that was fun, us doing it together. And we recut that quite a bit. And finally, the one that was heartbreaking to her. Chris and I just kind of like watched all the footage and I was just wowed by that section. At the end, I'll mention a way for you to see a full analysis of the biggest scene in the film, the Trinity Test. You are the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves. Are you ready? And the world is not prepared. Let's go. I'm going to look at specific scenes in Oppenheimer to look at the specific challenges and maybe find out why this does deserve winning the Oscar, if it does. Jennifer talked about the fact that the way that this entire movie is crafted, all this non-linear stuff, all that is pretty much scripted. Christopher Nolan already pre-planned this. This is an example of a scene where they didn't have a lot of choices in the editing. It was sort of all very efficiently shot. Do I have to make an appointment? So we have this run up and then he's going to figure out how to split the atom on this chalkboard. And there's very little coverage to make this happen. So let's watch this down. He's like, they split the atom, they did it. Goes into the room and then they have that moment where he's like, you know what, we're everybody's thinking. That section, that little piece, it's a great example of like Chris's incredible efficiency and also Hoyt does. Cause like that really cool shot by the chalkboard where he's furiously writing and then like it cuts and he stands back. Like that's just a really great, clever directing and writing mechanism of just efficiency. There's so much story to cover. So let's look at this again. It starts off with like being still about the B story, which is his love interest and no music. I didn't expect to see you today. Boom, story turn. We hear the bell, so sound and start of music. Music and sound sort of indicates the story turn. We're now going in a different direction with the A story. It's from behind. Alvarez? Yeah, this is a follow. Hey, John. They've done it. Hahn and Strassman in Germany. They split the uranium. It's a one hour almost. Insert. And then this is almost a new scene right here. From what I can tell, basically two angles and an insert to cover this. So this is, this is all the same angle here. So I went ahead and gave each different camera setup a unique color to find out how few angles were actually shot and available in the editing. And then this is a new scene. So what do we have in this scene? We have one, two, three different setups, one insert and a flashback. Very simple scene that is very dynamic and very like it really captures the energy of the moment, which is like this is a big story turn. Now they know that somebody else split the atoms, that they are sort of under the gun. And again, this is an example of a scene where it was completely planned that way. But I'm still trying to find that scene where they had to find it in the editing. And this was now that they know that it can be done, he has to recruit a team. Why would I leave my family? I told you, you can bring your family. I'm not a soldier, I mean. A soldier? He's a general. I've got all the soldier I need. This was one of the few scenes where the script didn't quite define the scene. And it had to do when he's recruiting the team at Berkeley, so all those young academics and they were being interviewed you know isotopes and you know explosives better than anyone in the world 
But you can't tell us what you're doing. That was not scripted as a montage. But I think he already even knew that that would probably have to become a montage. He kind of signaled to me, like, start thinking about that. Why would we go to the middle of nowhere for who knows how long? Because he already kind of knew after shooting it. But that was really fun because even though he knew it, he didn't know necessarily exactly how to do it. How about because this is the most important fucking thing that ever happened in the history of the world? So that was fun, us doing it together. And we recut that quite a bit. This is a national emergency. I've got some skeletons, they put me in charge. They need us. Until they don't. I checked with the British. Okay, so I think that's so the end of this montage. But it is a sequence that is a minute and 47, minute 48. Let's see how many different scenes within a scene we have. Why would I leave my family? I told you, you can So this is like family. in a hallway. So again, I began color coding the different scenes that were intercut and turned into a montage sequence in order to heighten urgency overall and play up the resistance of the various scientist recruits. Three, four, five different scenes that were supposedly all shot in sequence one by one. In the script, they were cut in sequence and then they would go through one by one. And because it was a very long scene, it just dragged and took forever. But by making it a montage with music, it sort of creates that tension and energy and the dramatic question, will he be able to form a team? And so let's look at this again in this context. We start off with the train. Let's go recruit some scientists. Why would I leave my family? Traveling to this guy. I told you, you can bring your family. I'm not a soldier. And then he's traveling to this guy. I mean, a soldier? He's a general. I've got all the soldier I need. What can I tell them? First thing that I noticed between these shots is that the camera is moving in. That's kind of like our establishing of each of these beats. It's a camera that goes from a master close up moving in and getting closer. Leave my family. I told you, you can bring your family. I'm not a soldier. I'm moving in. Soldier. He's a general. Let's see if they keep that up. I need. Both aboard. There's movement here. I mean, it's not moving in, but there's movement here. And it's a reveal also because see the guys in a silhouette? Mine's on atomic theory. Yes, and? Boom, uh, light. As much as you Back like. Back to the train. You know isotopes. Continue and that you know shot from earlier. Than anyone in the world. But you can't tell us what you're doing. Reverse. Doing. Wow, that's fast. Look at this, how fast they cut to the sort of what I call the master. This moving in shot. This is what's like a big back and forth reaction to this beat to really magnify and emphasize that there's his retort. So why this is not going to work to really sort of let that sink in that they're up against some real obstacles. And that needed to be emphasized with these like quick cuts and reaction shots of Oppenheimer and the general. Boom, boom, boom. Speechless. I don't know. Nazis have them. So this is all failure, right? They're not succeeding, which creates tension. They have this obstacle, they have this goal, and they have this obstacle, people giving them reasons why this won't work. The more we tease that it's not working, the more tension we feel, the more drama there is in the scene. Why would you think I'd do that? Why? Why? But we leave it open, we leave it hanging. All these recruitments, we don't know if they convince them. Again, this is an example of a scene where the editing really shapes that scene and makes it succeed without this structure it wouldn't be as impactful it wouldn't be as dramatic it wouldn't have so many open loops that need closing later the dramatic question wouldn't be as effective before i go to the last scene analysis in the video where i look at what the editor describes as the most heartbreaking moment in the film i want to point out that i did a full analysis of the trinity test and that's a video all on its own as that beat is the climax of the film and the one scene they kept to last in the editing. If you want to see that, I leave a link in the video description and you will be able to get my take on it. Watch for this of world. change right here. It's on his face. I will ask for your email, but it is fully available for free. Enjoy. Another scene that's interesting has to do with the, I think it's called room 22. That's that back room where he has an, a hearing that they don't want the world to know about because they kind of want to shut him up. And in that hearing, his wife learns about the affair. Doctor, did you think social contacts between a person engaged on secret war work and communists was dangerous? My awareness of the danger would be greater today. You left. Yeah, I think we really just wanted the most emotional performance between Lawrence and Killian in the actual hotel room. And um, I find that scene to be kind of heartbreaking. Where did you go? I can't tell you. Why not? Because you're 
you're a communist. What did you have to see her? She had indicated a great desire to see me before we left. So let's look at that scene again, but I think we kind of already figured out that it's about him sort of exposing this affair to his wife. She was undergoing psychiatric treatment. She was extremely unhappy. Did you find out why she had to see you? It's an interesting cut here. Find out why she had to see you. I had to see you. Why are they cutting to the back of his head? I almost find it distracting. Extremely unhappy. Did you find out why she had to see you? Oh, because it's revealing that he's naked. Got it. Because she was still in love with me. You don't catch it at first, and that's intentional. We're hiding the fact that he's naked right now. Look, he's he's but wearing a suit. She had to see me. Did you find out why she had to see you? Boom. Like, you don't catch it. Pretty clear, right, why he's naked right now? Because he has to expose himself. So whose point of view is this? Is it hers or is it Oppenheimer's? Well, it's hers. Yes. It just answers the question right away with the shot. And the best way to visualize it is obviously with uh, Oppenheimer having sex with his mistress, figuratively and literally in the hearing room. And the best way to introduce that was with that reveal where we switch camera access. Actually, a friend of mine who shot Better Luck Tomorrow, he is a big fan of having the camera travel behind the head of a character in order to reveal new information, a new perspective, a turn. You like Steph. And this is exactly what they're doing here as well. Traditionally, you would think that's the kind of shot that you use a close-up or medium close-up, so we can really sort of enjoy what's going on in his face emotionally. But this is bigger. This is not about him. It's not about the mistress. It's not about the hearing. It's about his wife. So the close-up gets actually awarded to her. And it's her point of view. You spent the night together, didn't you? It's just so devastating. And like Florence with the makeup, she, you know, Killian looks older, but she's the same age, which really makes me feel really emotional. It's just the whole thing is just so sad. As you're cutting scenes, you often become the characters yourself. Like I have that experience when I cut a film and I spend so much time with these characters that at the end of the day, I start having the same thought process that they have or feeling the same things so i mean there's so much more i could talk about like how where the music ends in this scene it's good to have these dynamic shifts when the music ends usually what happens once music ends the next couple of lines really sink in with the audience let's try this here you drop in and out of my life and you don't have to tell me why now that's power I don't know how we're going to show this on YouTube. We're probably going to have to just blur this out and I apologize. I wish we didn't have to because obviously this is art and Christopher Nolan decided to make this as visually honest and vulnerable as he can. Like the act, everybody's vulnerable in this scene. And so I think he didn't have a hard time convincing the actors to do this. First of all, he's Christopher Nolan. They're working on the biggest movie ever. But at the same time, it makes sense for the scene for them to be this exposed. I have a wife and child. On a 70 millimeter IMAX film. That's not what either of us is talking about. This is one of the very few scenes in this film where they're completely without music. So if I pick any other moment, chances are we'll have music. You went back the next morning. I did. That wouldn't See that? Involve. I just go randomly anywhere. We have music. Let's go one forward. Physics and New Mexico. Music. Huh? She says this is the one time where they don't play music. It was a very conscious choice. It's a big climax in the film. She's about to commit suicide. She says you have power over me and that power is so strong that I can't live with it. Jennifer reports that the first cut of this film was three and a half hours or 325. So she got about four weeks to do her editor's cut. And he basically just said, if you don't get through it all, don't worry, I just want you to see everything. Nolan is very involved in the editing. So after those four weeks starts the director's cut and he takes 10 weeks, not a day longer. He goes in there and they sort of 
work at a very swift pace. Apparently it's not very stressful, but they're getting things done every day. And there's something really great about doing things with a really hard deadline and with a very swift pace. This could be a very overwhelming project to work on because you have such great people working on this with so much experience and talent. Mm -hmm. It becomes a very exciting project on its own. And that's how I feel when, when I work on indie films that are not potentially be this, this well thought out. They still have that same energy of excitement of just making it, making things and not thinking too hard about it, just creating and then letting it be what it wants to be. Do let me know again if you like this episode, give it a thumbs up and more importantly, suggest a film, suggest a specific scene in that film that you would like me to take a look at and I'm gonna try and keep this up. I'm spending a day or two and we're gonna try and pop them out on a very regular basis. Thanks so much for watching, happy editing. As I always say, the best way to learn editing is to just edit, just do it. Then you'll really start to understand what it takes to cut a film.